About uh, 50 years ago, C.S. Lewis wrote a small essay called Xmas and Christmas. And in the small essay, he made up a fake country and he took the name of his Britain and he turned it around. So it was Nyaturb. It was Britain spelled backwards. And he told the story about this nation that celebrated a winter festival called Xmas. And the nation took 50 days to get ready for the celebration of Xmas. And those 50 days they called the Xmas Rush. And he said that it seems like the main goal of this winter festival of Xmas is to drive yourself as crazy as you can. To schedule as full as you can so that at the end of the day, the day you will not only be tired, but you will be crabby. So that when you get to Xmas at the end of the Xmas rush, you spend more money than you have so that you'll really be upset on the day of Xmas. And then when the day of Xmas comes, you'll be so worn out and so crabby that the families might be fighting with each other. You sleep until noon, and then you get up after noon and you eat five times more than you normally would just to drive it in so the day after Xmas, you feel even worse. And he said, in this nation of Nyaturb, there's a small rebel group, and they also celebrate a winter festival on the same day as Xmas. And this small rebel group, instead of participating in trying to drive yourself crazy, they go to their temples throughout, throughout those 50 days. And when they go in the temple, they simply kneel down and they surrender themselves to their God. Then on the day that comes, they don't call it Xmas, they call it Christmas. On the day of Christmas, they don't sleep in late and eat five times as much food. They get up early and they run to the temple and they sing songs of rejoicing. And again, they surrender themselves to their God. That was over 50 years ago in Britain. I don't know that we've advanced any in celebrating Christmas. I think Xmas has grown exponentially in our own country. So we are rebels, and during this season of Advent, be part of that small rebel group. One thing I love about Advent, it's a season of waiting and preparing. And it seems to me that Advent gives us permission to not have to go crazy. That's all Advent does. It gives you permission. You don't need to go crazy like the rest of the world. We do need to wait patiently. We do need to learn how to surrender ourselves to our God. And when we do that during these days, we'll be ready when Christmas comes. Today is Rejoice Sunday, Gaudate Sunday. It's a Latin phrase and it's an imperative, it's a command. You must rejoice today. Whether you feel like it or not, you must rejoice. So we light the third rose-colored candle on our wreath. We know that Christmas is near, but even more so, we know that our Lord Jesus is near. He is coming. Rejoicing is an attitude, not a feeling. It's like love. In our faith, love is an attitude and a choice. It's not a romantic feeling that might come and might go. Rejoicing is the same. Even if I don't feel like rejoicing, can I rejoice? What about people in Connecticut who are mourning the death of their children? A senseless act of violence in a grade school. They don't feel much like rejoicing today, I am sure. But yet our church stands here and says, you must rejoice today. How can you do that? And maybe in your own life, there's just so much happening that seems to weigh me down. I can't even think about smiling. A friend of mine is a priest, and people have told him, Father, you need to smile more. So he's practicing smiling. And when I see him, he looks like this. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's not a smile, that's a grimace. And he says, I know, I'm trying, though, I'm trying. There was a priest in Ireland who uh, went to a new parish, and he kept meeting with his parish council, and he said, give me a job description. What do you expect of me? And they said, well, we'll get to it, Father. We'll get to it. And after three months of this, he kept asking, give me my job description. What do you expect of me? And finally, one of the older women in the parish council said, Father, we just want you to be joyful. That's your job description. Um, some people say that to be a crabby priest is an oxymoron. And I would say to be a crabby Christian is also an oxymoron. We know that uh, people, uh, people leave the church for lots of reasons. And my experience is not many people leave the church because of our teaching on women's ordination or our teaching on abortion. Many people leave the church because of a crabby priest. And I would say the same as a baptized believer. Um, what kind of a message are we giving to the world just by our face, but even more so by our attitude, by our stance? So on this day of rejoicing, I think back 
uh, Cardinal Dolan of New York City wrote a book a couple years ago to his priests. And one of the chapters he entitled Joy. And he was exhorting them and telling them, you need to be a joyful priest. Um, that will show the world more than anything else. Uh, I'm, I'm an introvert. I'm shy by nature. And I get focused on things. So the look on my face is usually one of kind of seriousness. I think I'm busy about many things. Um, I need to learn how to smile more. And I think as Christians, maybe all of us need that. In his book, Cardinal Dolan said, there are a few different main sources of our joy. And again, joy is an attitude, not a feeling. It's a knowledge. And the first source of our joy ought to be the knowledge that we are incredibly loved by our God. The reason why you're here right now at this moment is because of God's love. If God ceased to love you, you would cease to exist. And even more so, God's love was expressed in my parents' act of love that created me along with God. So in a sense, a definition of me, I'm, I'm a result of love that gets to walk around in the world. I am a result of my parents' love, which is an expression of God's love. That's our definition. So I have the knowledge that I am loved by God. You are loved by God. That's why you're here. That's the first source of our joy. A second source of our joy is that God didn't just make you out of love and then leave you alone. We believe that God is inside of us at this very moment. We call that sanctifying grace. That means that God right now is active in your life. He's involved in your life. He is dwelling within you. He has begun some work in you, and we trust that by sanctifying grace, God will complete the work God has begun. Whenever we come to celebrate our sacraments, God's love and God's grace and God's life is trying to get in you. And that's why we hear the word of God and we receive the blessed sacrament so that we can participate in God's grace. God has begun something in you, and God's not done with you yet. That's really good news. So I need to continue to trust that, give myself over to that, and remember, God is active in me. God's sanctifying grace will complete me one day. And whatever God doesn't get done with me here on earth, God will complete in heaven. That's very good news for those of us that have families that are divided, or relationships that are fractured, and we just don't know if they're ever going to get healed on earth. God will complete and heal them in heaven. That's what God does. And a third source of our joy is divine providence. It's simply the knowledge that God knows a whole lot more than I do. God began something before I got here. God will complete it after I'm gone. I want to trust that. I don't understand a man walking in and killing defenseless children. I can never understand that. I wish sometimes God did not give us freedom of choice because many times we freely choose to hurt people and even murder and violence is the worst way of doing that. Sometimes I wish God didn't give us that freedom of choice. I wish that God just controlled everything. But that's not the way God created the world, for some very good reasons. God wants us to choose God out of love. That's the first reason. So I want to trust in divine providence. God knows more about what's going on than I do. And that's very good news. And then Cardinal Dolan also listed a few things that take away our joy. And I just mentioned three of them briefly, and I think you know these things inside of you. The first thing that saps us from joy is self-pity. It's okay to feel self-pity. It's okay to visit self-pity. It's not okay to take up residence there for the rest of your life. And the worst thing about self-pity, who is it focused on? Self. What's the opposite of self-pity? Christ consciousness. It means that I'm focusing more on Christ than on me. That's a stance. That's an attitude. That's why when we sit here in church, we look to Jesus Christ. We focus on him because that's the answer and the antidote to self-pity. So if you've been wallowing in it for a while, you don't need to do that anymore. And if you keep wallowing in self-pity, your joy is going to disappear. Don't let that happen. What is it about self-pity that makes us want to stay there? There's something about that. We just like to hold on to it. On this day of joy, let go of it. A second thing that saps us from our joy is worry. Um, Cardinal Dolan told a story about uh, Cardinal Bernadine, the former Archbishop of Chicago. And when Cardinal Bernadine was first appointed Archbishop of Chicago, he went into the Archbishop's office and on his desk was a thick file. 
and the former cardinal had wrote a note on it that said, crises, these need immediate attention. And Cardinal Bernadine asked the secretary, how long has that file been there? She said, I don't know, about nine months, I think. He said, those crises lasted nine months without him. Um, and the world continued on, and the church continued. Now, there are some things that need our attention, but we don't need to carry that worry with us in every part of our life. And then lastly, what saps us from our joy? And I've, I heard it today already, and I heard it even out of my own voice. What saps us from joy is complaining. We complain about other people, we complain about the world, we complain about people in power, we complain about our spouses, we complain about our brothers and sisters right here. Again, you can visit complaining, don't take up residence there. Don't let your voice be one of complaining all the time. In fact, between now and Christmas, how can I take complaining and put it aside? And then what will take its place? We find that another way of being will take its place, that's the way of joy. So on this day of rejoicing, the Lord is near. He's coming. You don't need to live in all that other stuff. So would you repeat after me? Gaudete. Gaudete. That's rejoice. So let's try to do that today.